cool. And we are live. So I'm going to mute myself on Facebook. All right, welcome back to the Asheville Museum of Science Ask a Scientist series. My name is Abby and I'm an educator with the Asheville Museum of Science. Um, today we have with us Dr. Wendy Bohan. Uh, Dr. Wendy is a geologist who studies earthquakes and works to improve the communication of hazard and risk before, during, and after a rapid onset geological hazard, such as earthquakes. So Dr. Bohan works for IRIS, which is Incorporated Research Institutions for Seismology, um, as a science communication specialist. Um, she's been selected as one of the 125 American Association for Advancements of Science, If Then Ambassadors. Um, the If Then Ambassador is a national initiative of the uh, Lita Hill Philanthropies that seeks to further women in STEM. So don't forget you can send in your questions at any time and I will pass those along. Um, and thank you very much. We are looking forward to this. I'll pass it off to you, Dr. Bohan. All right, thank you so much. I appreciate it. And I appreciate everybody for watching today. This is the part where I say I'm gonna share my screen. Can you see it? So can you see it? Thumbs up, awesome. We're gonna talk about earthquakes. So it's kind of hard sometimes to be a person that studies earthquakes because I get really excited about them. They're fascinating, they're so interesting and there's so little that we understand but also earthquakes can be damaging. They can be terrifying. They're, you know, cause a lot of anxiety and a lot of destruction. So we have to be real careful about how we talk about earthquakes because they really do uh, damage people's lives and property. So why would I study earthquakes? Why would I wanna study something that's kind of scary? Well, I wanna answer a fundamental set of questions. I'm interested in knowing where the faults are, how often there's earthquakes on those faults, how big those earthquakes could be, when they might happen and what effect they would have on people and infrastructure. So those are the topics that we're gonna cover today. But it's always best to start a story at the beginning, right? So let's start at the beginning. Um, this is the composition of the earth, the very, very generalized composition. So in the middle, you have the core. Most of the volume of the earth is made up of the mantle. It's really thick and kind of gooey. You can think of it sort of like silly putty. And then the crust. The crust is less than 1% of the Earth's mass. So you can think about the Earth kind of like an egg and the lithosphere, the outside part would be like the shell. And so the Earth's crust is made up of all these different things. I wanna show you, these are all earthquakes around the world, all of these flashes. And if you look carefully, you can see that these flashes kind of make a pattern. Do you see that? That pattern forms the outline of the tectonic plates. So there's lots of different tectonic plates and this is where the crust of the earth is broken up onto all these different pieces. And these pieces are moving around over the surface of the earth really slowly. So in this image, the arrows are showing the direction of motion and the length of the arrow tells you how fast that plate is moving. And you can see the boundaries between those plates have different colors and symbols because these plates can come together in different ways. So they can slide past each other like this image at the top. They can pull apart from each other or they can come together or converge. And these three different types of ways that the plates can interact cause three different kinds of boundaries and three different kinds of faults. So when we have the crust getting stretched or extended, pulled apart, that makes a normal fault where one block drops down. If you squeeze it or compress it, that creates a reverse fault or a thrust fault where one block gets pushed up. And if you push it sideways or shear it, then that causes a strike slip fault. Let's watch that one again, because it's pretty cool. Pull it apart or extend it, makes a normal fault, push it together or compress it, and that makes a reverse or a thrust fault. And then if you push it sideways or shear it, you get a strike slip fault. And so I keep talking about an earthquake. What's an earthquake? Right, we hear about that, but what does that actually mean? So as the tectonic plates are moving and as they're causing stress within the crust of the earth, the brittle part of the earth that's gonna break, um, eventually the stress is gonna be overcome and the rocks are gonna break along something called a fault. And when that happens, it releases energy and we feel that energy that gets released as shaking. So this is basically what an earthquake is. You have the earth stress building up under the ground Eventually it breaks and then the energy waves travel out in all directions that we feel as shaking. So the first question we wanna answer is where is the fault? 
And the easiest way to think about that is by looking at this map, right? Most of the earthquakes happen along the plate boundaries, but there are some that happen in other places as well. But we know where there were earthquakes before, there's likely to be earthquakes again. So that's our first hint. We can also use special equipment like GPS systems or global positioning systems. And this is a picture of a scientific um, GPS station. This is from the organization UNAVCO, which is the sister organization to mine. They do the geodesy, we do the seismology. And all of these instruments all around the world are measuring the very slow motions of the crust. So the image on the left is showing tectonic motions of the Western United States. Each one of these tiny little black dots is a GPS instrument like the one that you see on the right. The arrows are showing you the direction that the ground is moving where that GPS is located. So the, the direction of the arrow is the direction and the length of the arrow is showing you the relative amount of motion. So in some places there's a lot of motion, in some places there's only a little bit of motion, in some places there's not a lot of motion at all. And so we're gonna look across this central, central section, but we're gonna look at Nevada first, okay? Because that is a really cool area. You see how there's like these lines in the map? Those are mountains and in between there are valleys, but that's sort of a weird looking topography or shape of the earth. So what does that mean? Well, what's happening is the crust in this area is being pulled apart or extended. Do you remember what kind of fault that makes? Normal faults. Yes, pull it apart, one block's gonna drop down. We know that because you see these two GPS instruments, if we look at how they change through time relative to each other, they're getting pulled away from each other. And then this is how the ground is deforming through extension. And what you end up getting are these mountains and then these valleys. So this is called the basin and range. And all of these uh, mountain ranges have normal faults on either side. So we can use GPS instruments to tell us how things are happening in between those. So if you imagine there was a two GPS and one was sliding, there would be a fault in between. So we would know to go and look in those places to find a fault. Another thing we can do is use a really super amazing kind of technology called LIDAR. So LIDAR is an optical remote sensing technology. So basically you, you put a laser, but a, a laser that doesn't hurt people in a plane or a helicopter or a drone, and then you fly it over the landscape and it sends thousands and thousands of laser beams down and they come back up. You know exactly where they are on the ground from a GPS. You know exactly where they are in the plane because there's a GPS in the plane. And this maps the surface of the ground in three dimensions. So you can actually move it all around and you can do really cool things like virtually deforest the ground. Why would we wanna do that? Like trees are amazing, I love them, but they get in the way of me seeing the ground and the faults are on the ground. So what we can do is uh, do special imaging work to pull out some of the, the laser beams that hit trees instead of hitting the ground so we can get rid of the trees, virtual deforestation so we can see the surface of the ground. This is an area in Northern California and now we can actually see where the San Andreas Fault is running underneath of those trees. But don't worry, we don't hurt any of the trees. We can put them all back. Oh, hold on just one, and then we can learn more even about the trees and the ecology. All right, so there's a question. Yeah, so that's really cool. Um, do we use the same kind of technology to track um, where the ocean is too? Like tra use it for earthquakes that happen, you know, not immediately where people are living? So LIDAR is um, fairly expensive to get and there's all different ways that you can do it. Um, it, we don't use it underneath the ocean. There's different techniques that we use for mapping the ocean. We can map using LIDAR underneath water, but more like rivers and stuff. Um, so usually you have to get some places, like a lot of the states will have LIDAR coverage, but it's not of a high enough resolution that we can make out things like features you would need to identify faults. Um, but a lot of places uh, it's, it's being used to look at on-land faults, but not, not off-land faults. And we use it for, if, if you guys want to talk about LIDAR, I could talk about LIDAR all day. They actually have found Mayan ruins using LIDAR and doing virtual deforestation of parts of the forest. And there's all sorts of amazing, amazing applications of LIDAR. So we can talk about that at the end if you want. So we can also use LIDAR to find exactly where the faults are. And why would we use LIDAR instead of the maps we already have? 
So if you look at the image up on the top that says USGS NED, that's the United States Geological Survey National Elevation Database. So this is a map made from uh, a topographic map. It's just could be anything, right? That could be water waves, it could be clouds, looks like a cloudy day. Down here on the bottom, this B4 based one meter DEM or digital elevation map, this is a LIDAR image of that exact same area. But instead of being 10 meter resolution, it's a one meter resolution. So this is like when you take a picture with a low res camera versus taking a picture with a high res camera. Now we can see exactly what's happening in this landscape. And in fact, the San Andreas Fault is going through this image. The San Andreas has moved this river just a little bit. Hey, and look, also this one. So that tells us something about where the fault is in between those two points. What does this look like on the ground? Well, here's that same little offset stream. It's difficult to see where it is, right? Because you have all of this stuff in the way, all of these bushes. And I love plants, but they're real kind of a pain when you're trying to look at the ground. So here's the San Andreas coming right through here. So this is another way that we can find faults. All right, so we've addressed the first question, which is where are the faults? Now we wanna know how often are there earthquakes on these faults? How big are those earthquakes gonna be? And when is the next earthquake likely to occur? So let's go back to our San Andreas example right here. We're gonna look at that same image that we did before, but we've changed the color. So this is uh, this long thing up here, isn't this cool? This is LIDAR of the entire Southern part of the San Andreas Fault. All of these little dots are places where we've done special studies called paleoseismic investigations. Paleoseismology is the study of ancient earthquakes. And the idea is that if you can figure out what the earthquakes that happened on the fault before were like, you can learn about what is possible and might potentially happen later. So all of these places are places that we've done that kind of research. And so we were working within this little white square. Uh, this is in central California. And that's what we're looking at in this orange and green image. So again, these are those little streams that were offset. And we wanted to learn about the San Andreas Fault in this area. So we dug trenches across the fault and all of these locations so we could look at the layers and how they had been moved and disturbed by previous earthquakes. So this is what that looks like from the air. These are balloon photos that we laid over top of the LIDAR. So you can see the trench going across here and then there's a trench right there. That's just so we have ideas of how things look in three dimensions. This is what it looks like on the ground. Here we are inside the trench and you may think I am a crazy person that I love to sit inside of dirt trenches and stare at walls, but you can learn so much. If you can learn to read the history of rocks and soil, you can read the whole history of the earth. So this is what we're doing in this picture. This is uh, taking pictures of that, that wall and then using a computer to annotate all of those different layers of soil. So when the soil is laid down, when rocks are laid down, uh, they're laid down generally pretty horizontal. And so if there's any disruption in the, the horizontal layers, if they've been broken or bent or changed, then you know something happened. And in this case, we know the fault is there, so it's most likely because of the fault. So all of these different layers, like let's look at the blue one, see how it goes across, and then it drops down, and then it's over here again, and then it's over there we can learn a lot about past earthquakes. And then we can date each one of these individual layers using different techniques like carbon-14 dating to figure out when these earthquakes might have happened. So if we can figure out when the earthquakes might have happened and how often they happen, that tells us when they're most likely to happen next. If we can do this along the whole entire length of the fault, that tells us about how big the earthquake can be. The magnitude of an earthquake is dependent on a lot of different factors, but largely <clears throat> is the result of how long the section of fault is that ruptures. So if you have a really long fault, you're more likely to have a bigger earthquake. So if you have a short fault or only a little piece of the fault that breaks, you're gonna have a smaller earthquake. So this is telling us whether or not these earthquakes affected the whole fault or small pieces of the fault. All right. And we have one question that is asking, so there's a lot of concern about natural events or natural disasters worsening with climate change. Is there any effect on earthquakes? Fortunately, no, because earthquakes begin far below the surface of the earth. Uh, in the news, we talk a lot about the epicenter, but earthquakes actually start at something called the hypocenter, which is miles or kilometers down. The epicenter is the point on the earth uh, directly above the hypocenter, 
but because that's the easiest thing for us to reference, that's where we say the earthquake was closest to. Um, and so fortunately, any of the changes that are happening on the surface of the earth aren't really going to affect earthquakes too much. Now, that being said, you can have earthquakes from things like isostatic rebound, like when glaciers are melting, um, ice is heavy. And so the ground underneath of it will start to slowly rise up afterwards. And that can sometimes cause earthquakes. But that's usually in places where there were glaciers and where there's glaciers, there's not always a ton of people. So it won't affect earthquakes in ways that are massively societally relevant. I would argue that uh, climate change is the largest issue facing our world today, much larger than earthquakes or volcanic eruptions or other things. So it's definitely something to consider. And it is something that affects all other systems. So it's a cascading hazard that can cause all other things, but not so much earthquakes, thank goodness. All right, so now we're back to basically that question, right? What effects are these earthquakes gonna have on people and our built environment, the things that matter to us? And so everything matters to us. You know what I mean though. Um, we're gonna talk about the different hazards from earthquakes. So the first thing we're gonna talk about is ground shaking. And that's the thing we usually think about when we're talking about earthquakes, how the, the ground shakes. This is a really neat video uh, from Kathmandu in Nepal. And this is from the Nepal earthquake that happened in um, 2015. It was really big, it did a lot of damage. This is showing uh, an area in like a, a marketplace. And if you look at that little white square in kind of the right side, that shows a GPS uh, sensor that was located nearby. The GPS sensor, it's like you're looking down at the GPS, right, from above. And so you're gonna see how the GPS moved through time, and then you can see how the people on the ground moved. So during strong earthquake shaking, it can be literally impossible to stay on your feet. Of course, this can damage buildings, this can cause things to fall on you. Uh, all of these videos and things I'm gonna show are available on our website, www.iris.edu. So the ground shaking can sometimes be confusing, right? Because we think a lot about earthquake magnitude, which is uh, related to the size of the earthquake or the amount of energy it released, but what we're actually often thinking about is the shaking. And so there's a lot of confusion about that. Every earthquake has one magnitude, the amount of energy that released it, or was released during the earthquake, but it has lots of different intensities of shaking. So that's what these are showing. There was an earthquake in Southern California called uh, the Ridgecrest earthquake that happened, there was a sequence of them, but happened on um, July 4th. And then there was, July 2nd and July 4th. Now I can't remember. It was in July. It was a big deal. There was significant shaking. So on the left-hand side, that star is showing the epicenter, which is the closest point on the surface. And the areas in red are the places that shook really, really hard. So they had a high intensity. As you move further away, you can see that the colors change. That's telling you about the shaking in those places. So the earthquake was still the same size, magnitude 7.1 but the amount of shaking people feel varies. On the right-hand side, this is called a, a did you feel it map. And these are the reports of shaking that were felt. So people go to the USGS and they put in their um, experience of the earthquake. So let's learn a little bit more about that. Magnitude and intensity are both related to the size of an earthquake, but they each measure different aspects. Magnitude, which measures the energy released at the source of the earthquake rupture and is calculated using measurements from seismic instruments is one single value. Seismic intensity, which is the measurement of the strength of shaking at a specific location determined from effects on people, human structures, and the natural environment, produces a range of shaking intensities in different locations. Thus, unlike earthquake magnitude, which is the same for all locations, the seismic intensity you feel depends on where you are. Intensity is mostly controlled by three factors. Magnitude, how big the earthquake was, distance from the hypocenter, intensity varies from place to place, and the local rock and soil conditions. Let's compare magnitude and intensity by using a light bulb as an analogy. The light bulb represents the location within the earth called the hypocenter, where the earthquake begins. 
The magnitude or size of an earthquake is like the wattage of a light bulb. Just as the wattage represents the amount of power of the light bulb, the magnitude is related to the total amount of energy released by the earthquake source. The intensity or shaking level is like the amount of light from a light bulb at any spot in a room. A small light bulb in one area of a room will make that area bright with high intensity light, but it will leave the distant areas of the room dim with low intensity light. So, a given earthquake has only one magnitude, but will produce different intensities of ground shaking as shown on the USGS Did You Feel It intensity maps. All right, so hopefully that clarified some things about magnitude and intensity and what we might feel during ground shaking. Another hazard uh, that maybe you don't think about sometimes is surface rupture. Not all earthquakes actually break the surface of the earth, right? They start deep inside the ground and they'll break, but they may not make it all the way to the top. Those are called blind earthquakes. Uh, this particular earthquake uh, that's shown in this image happened in New Zealand. This is the Kaikoura earthquake uh, from 2016. And in this case, the fault went directly underneath this house. And so when the fault broke all the way to the surface, it tore this house in half. In California, uh, after the 1971 Silmar earthquake, legislation uh, was enacted that said that no more structures could be built on active faults. So that seems like a reasonable thing, right? That's called the Aquas Priolo Act. Another factor that can happen during earthquake shaking or as a result of earthquake shaking that's a secondary hazard is called liquefaction. And this is where you have uh, loose soil that has a high water table or for some reason has a lot of water. And as the earthquake waves come through, they push that water up towards the surface, which causes all the little sand grains or, or dirt grains to separate, which means that you lose stability at the surface. It's like the ground turns into quicksand. So has anybody ever stood um, at the edge of a beach where the, gra the ground is really wet and you know you shake your feet back and forth and you sink down? That's basically what happens to houses and structures during uh, earthquake shaking if there's a possibility for liquefaction. So here's another example. You have this loose sand or soil saturated by water. The earthquake happens, uh-oh, uh-oh for your house. So this happened very extensively in San Francisco during the 1906 earthquake on the San Andreas Fault. Another example of secondary hazard is landslides. Uh, particularly if you have slopes that have been changed because of construction. Maybe there was a wildfire, so the uh, vegetation that was there is gone, and so some of the soil stability has been lost. Um, maybe it's just a really steep slope. You have earthquake shaking, and that can overburden that slope and cause it to fail. So this is an example of a house in the Pacific Palisades in California um, that collapsed because of a landslide during the 1994 Northridge earthquake. So there were more than 11,000 earthquakes caused uh, during, uh, 11,000 landslides caused during the Northridge earthquake in 1994. You can have all of these hazards all in the same place, right? So if you go to the California Geological Survey page, and they have these for a lot of different states where there's a high seismic hazard, you can learn about exactly where you are and what the different hazards are where you are. So what this map is showing, this is of the LA area for anybody that's familiar. UCLA is right up here. LA Country Club's over here. This is Santa Monica. Obviously this is the beach, Malibu's over this way. Um, these are different hazards. The, the blue are landslide hazards. The yellow, these are active fault traces. So faults that have ruptured within the last 10,000 years. And then the green here is uh, areas that are likely to experience liquefaction. So you have ground shaking hazard for this whole area, and then you have these other specialized hazards that go along with that. But there's a difference between a hazard and a risk, right? So a hazard is something that has the potential to harm you, like a shark, right? But if you're not in the water, then you know, you're not in a lot of risk from a shark. You really have risk from a shark if you are in the water. So risk is the likelihood of a hazard causing harm. Now, this is, you may be like, okay, who cares? Those things are so similar, why does it matter? Well, there's really no such thing as a natural disaster. Disasters only happen when you have a natural hazard that's overlapping with a vulnerable system. So a natural hazard is any potentially catastrophic physical event from the natural world. It could be a flood or a tornado or an earthquake, anything like that. And then a vulnerable system is something that for whatever reason, 
is not prepared to deal with that hazard. Um, for instance, if you think about Haiti, uh, Haiti is an island that gets pummeled by hurricanes. We've seen that a lot so far, even this year. So a lot of the structures that are there are built to withstand hurricanes. But Haiti also has a high earthquake risk. They just don't happen as often. Unfortunately, uh, structures that are really good at withstanding hurricanes are not really good at withstanding earthquakes. So they are a vulnerable system for earthquakes. This is also important because um, not every population is able to respond to hazards. And we see, saw this in Hurricane Katrina. Um, people weren't able to actually evacuate because they didn't have the, the means to go. A lot of people that are in uh, cities don't have cars because you can take public transportation. Well, what do you do when you have to have a car to evacuate? So in a lot of cases, people don't have the ability to, to, to keep themselves from harm. And so they're vulnerable populations and we need to keep those folks in mind too. So these hazards become disasters when we look at this overlap. So let's think about that in a little more detail. Hazards are all around. Cars, ladders, banana peels. A staircase can be a hazard. The risk is possible injury or worse. Hazards are anything that can cause harm. Risk is the potential for a hazard to cause harm. A seismic hazard is the probability of ground shaking due to earthquakes and other effects of earthquakes, including ground rupture, landslides, tsunamis, and soil liquefaction. Seismic risk is the likelihood that humans might sustain injuries and fatalities, plus economic losses due to the hazard. Risk and the perception of risk are not always aligned. A seismic hazard map assesses the possibility of future ground shaking at a location based on the past history of nearby earthquakes and ground shaking, plus what we know about faults in the area from geologic, geodetic, and seismological information. The hazard also depends on how the ground responds to shaking, which depends on the subsurface rock layers. In an open field, someone experiencing strong shaking would just fall down. Hence, most seismic risk comes from the possible collapse of buildings due to shaking. Let's look at two examples. A person in a high seismic hazard zone in a well-engineered high-rise has low seismic risk. A weak structure built in a low seismic hazard zone may have high seismic risk from even light shaking. Risk assessment takes into account the hazards, population density, man-made structures, weak building materials, and more. Again, a seismic hazard is the probability that earthquake shaking of a certain intensity will occur in a given geographic area within a given window of time. From that, risks can be assessed and included in mitigation efforts. So this is particularly relevant to those of us uh, on the East Coast. So the crust doesn't always respond to earthquakes in the same way. The west coast of the United States is along the plate boundary between the Pacific plate and the North American plate. So they have the majority of the earthquakes uh, in this area. So the west coast and Alaska. The east coast and the central US don't get as many earthquakes. But which community is more prepared for earthquakes? It's not the east coast, is it? It's not the Midwest. Nope, sure not. The West Coast is ready for earthquakes. They have structures that are engineered to withstand earthquakes for the most part. They have a population that knows what to do. They've been well educated about what steps to take when they feel earthquake shaking. But people on the East Coast and the Midwest, we have different hazards, right? We have hurricanes, we have tornadoes, we have floods. And so we don't think much about earthquakes and we don't know what to do when an earthquake happens. So we are a vulnerable population in that way. We're a vulnerable population because our infrastructure is not designed to withstand shaking from earthquakes. So we're vulnerable there too. And the crust in these areas is different. So on the West Coast, the crust is still warm and it's really broken up. So the seismic waves don't travel very far. On the East Coast and in the Midwest, the crust is older, colder, and denser. And we have a lot of sediment cover from all these mountains that have been eroding for millions of years. And so the seismic waves travel really well. So they actually travel further and are often felt by more people. So these are examples of earthquakes of similar size magnitude, except for the one in purple, uh, a six in California, a 5.8 in Oklahoma, a 5.8 in Central Virginia, and then a 4.1 in uh, Dover, Delaware. And you can see how much farther the earthquakes in 
the Midwest, and the East Coast are. Each one of these little dots is a felt report. So each one of those was, uh, you know, somebody like wrote in and said that I felt this particular earthquake. So this uh, Virginia earthquake, the 5.8 that happened um, in 2011 was the widest, most felt earthquake in the history of the US. It wasn't the biggest, but there's a lot of people on the East Coast and it was felt over a really, really broad area all the way from Florida into Canada. And that was only a magnitude 5.8. Folks in California feel a 5.8 and they're like, hmm, hope it doesn't get too much bigger. You know, it barely interrupts their day. Now you guys down in uh, North Carolina just had a 5.1 that was felt widely over the East Coast. And let me tell you, I was visiting my parents who live in Southeastern Virginia and I didn't feel it. And I was so bummed, like so bummed. There was some damage, you know, not a lot of damage, but there was damage. And a lot of people felt that shaking. So earthquakes can happen anytime. Everywhere really is earthquake country. So we need to think about what we can do to be safe from earthquakes, right? We need to reduce our vulnerability. And by doing that, we reduce our earthquake risk. Luckily, a lot of the things you do to reduce your risk from earthquakes also reduce your risk from other hazards. Things that are different about earthquakes, you need to secure your space in a different way. You want to strap water heaters down. Uh, if you're in a place like California or Washington State, you want to make sure that you have your house bolted to the foundation. But we can do little things here on the East Coast, like, you know, don't hang a big giant mirror over the place where you sleep that could fall on your head in case there's an earthquake. This is something, number two, that's good for everybody. Plan to be safe. Know what to do if the hazard happens. Know who to call. What if you're at home? What if your kids are at school, if we ever end up doing that again? You know, know think about where you might be at a different time if a disaster were to happen and plan for that. And again, a disaster kit. Make sure that you have enough food and water for yourself and your family for two weeks. Don't forget your pets. They're part of the family too. You need pet food and water for them. You wanna minimize financial hardship. Make sure you have some cash on hand. Make sure that all of your important documents and things are in another uh, location altogether in case you need to evacuate. If you feel earthquake shaking, immediately drop down to the ground, take cover underneath a sturdy object and hold on. The biggest threat from earthquakes in the U.S. is things falling on top of us. So we want to minimize that by getting underneath a table or something similar. Then after the threat is over, you want to improve the safety of your environment. Clean up any chemical spills, clean up any broken glass, and then afterwards work with your community. You know, disasters happen. We want to survive them, but we also want to thrive in the aftermath. And in order to do that, we all have to come together and work together. So again, another little video, and all of these are available on our website. You can see all of these. We have hundreds of them. If you live in earthquake-prone regions, it isn't a question of if, but when an earthquake will occur. We do not know where we will be when it strikes, but we can know how to protect ourselves when it happens. Here are the best ways to protect yourself when an earthquake strikes. If you are inside a building, do not run outside. Drop, cover, and hold on. Drop to your hands and knees, take cover under something sturdy and cover your head and neck and hold on until the shaking stops. If you are in bed, roll onto your stomach, cover your head and neck with a pillow and hold on. If you are in a classroom, take cover under a desk and hold on. If you are in a lab or other area with chemicals or machinery, be aware of all hazards before you drop cover and hold on. If you are using a wheelchair or walker, lock your wheels if possible, then cover your head and neck and hold on until shaking stops. If you are in a high rise, drop, cover, and hold on. When shaking stops, use the stairs. Do not use the elevator. In a store or where there are freestanding shelves, move quickly to a protected area next to a shopping cart or beneath clothing racks, then drop, cover, and hold on. If you are outdoors, move quickly away from buildings to avoid falling debris or away from power lines and other hazards. Drop, cover, and hold on. If driving, pull over, avoiding overpasses, bridges, power lines, and other hazards. Stop, set the parking brake, stay in the vehicle until shaking stops. If you are near a shoreline, a tsunami may be coming. Drop, cover, and hold on then stand and move quickly to high ground or inland. 
stay there until tsunami restrictions are lifted. What you do during an earthquake depends on where you are, but the basics will remain the same. It can be difficult to run or even walk when the ground is shaking. Drop and crawl if you need to move to a safer location. The greatest danger during an earthquake is from falling or flying objects, which is why you need to take cover. Protect your head and neck with your arms or with other objects. Earthquake shaking can last from seconds to several minutes. Hold on for the entire time. For more information on earthquake protective actions and how to get prepared, visit www.shakeout.org. So that's all that I have prepared for you today. I can talk to you about LIDAR or earthquakes or any kind of stuff you want to talk about, research, whatever. But here's um, my personal website. Here's the website of my fabulous company that I work for. We're uh, funded by the National Science Foundation. And then you can also find me on all the social medias. So I'll give you a minute to look at that. And then I will stop sharing my screen and see if anybody has any questions or things that you just want to chat about. Yeah, so we do have one question from Katie that says, what is happening so deeply within the earth that causes the earthquakes? And I think she's, uh, she means kind of like, is it just passive plate movement that's going to cause them to interact? Mm -hmm. at, the, at the core of it, tectonic earthquakes are caused by the motion of the tectonic plates. So as they're moving around, um, they're building up stress inside the rocks. And something that we don't really think about too much is that rocks are actually elastic. They can have sort of like pencils Pencils, you think of them as rigid, but they actually have some amount of elasticity. You can bend them a little bit before they break. So rocks are the same way. They can bend a little bit before they break. So they, they collect all of this tension through time. And then eventually, just like a pencil, you know, you push it far enough and it's going to break. And earthquakes are the same way. But it's that force that's pushing, which is the tectonic plates that causes the earthquakes. Now, people can cause earthquakes. Um, we've been doing it for a really long time. Mining can sometimes cause earthquakes, but now what you hear a lot about is something called, well, fracking or wastewater injection. So in order to get hydrocarbons out of particular types of rocks, sometimes uh, uh, organizations, companies will put water down in there that helps to break the rocks and then they can get uh, whatever hydrocarbons uh, out that they want. The problem is that the water that comes out with the hydrocarbons is really dirty, it's wastewater. And so you can't get rid of it on the surface. You wanna put it back inside the ground because the ground can act like a really good filter. And so if you put that water back inside the ground in an area where there might be um, faults, you can change the frictional properties of the faults, kind of lubricate the faults and cause earthquakes that way. So that's uh, called induced earthquakes or man-made earthquakes. That's not something we wanna do. <laughs> And then this person definitely lives on the East Coast. We have, do schools and earthquake prone areas have earthquake drills regularly? Do they or should they? Do they? Yes, they do. Um, I did not, I grew up on the East Coast, but I you know, lived in California for a really long time. My husband grew up in California and he talks about the earthquake drills they had. I've been in a school teaching, talking to students once when we had an earthquake drill. And if you, there's a bunch of videos from the earthquake in Alaska a few years ago, and man, those students were on it. You can see the first waves come through, and then they were all underneath the desks. That's why it's really important to practice earthquake drills. You know, when you're in this really stressful situation, right, like your brain doesn't work. Now, am I the only one? I don't think I am, where you're like, there again, I don't know what to do. You're frozen, deer in headlights. If you have that muscle memory of what to do when you feel shaking, you're much more likely to make really good choices and to make safe choices. So it is really good to have uh, earthquake drills and the biggest earthquake drill in the world is coming up. It's in October. It's called the Great Shakeout and millions and millions of people from around the world participate in it. So it's not just a California thing or a Japan thing. It's like everybody can take a couple of minutes on this day to practice what to do during an earthquake with all these other millions of people. It's super fun. Awesome. The museum will definitely have to take part in that. And we have a question that says, what types of earthquake cause the most amount of energy release? Is it when plates pull apart, when they come together, when they slide past one another? Uh, does it depend on the type of rock or the friction between rocks? What a fabulous question. 
So the largest earthquakes occur along subduction zones and subduction zones are places where plates come together. And the reason for that is when the plates come together, one gets uh, pushed down or subducted beneath the other one. Usually this is uh, the downgoing plate is an oceanic plate. And so it's gonna be cold and dense. And when things are cold and dense, they can break more easily. Think about a chocolate bar, right? You pull it out of the freezer, you can just break it. But if you leave it in the sun a little bit, it's gonna bend, it's not gonna break and rocks are similar. Once they get down inside the mantle, they're not rigid anymore. They get to be kind of melty and gooey so they don't break. So you have to have rocks that are rigid in order for them to break. So since this is really rigid and it's going down, you can get mega earthquakes that way. The largest earthquakes that happen occur on those plates because of the size of the area that's moving. So if you have a long fault and also a deep fault, it's this whole area that's gonna break. You can kind of think about it like, um, you know, like those runner rugs that people have in their hallways. Imagine you have a carpeted hallway with one of those long skinny runner rugs and you're trying to pull it. That takes some energy, but if you have a full sized rug in a really big room and you're trying to pull it, like it takes a lot more energy. It's a lot harder to move. So if you have these faults that are deep and long, it's releasing a lot more energy when it breaks than faults that are like short and deep or long and shallow. Mm -hmm. And uh, how far in advance do you, are you typically able to predict uh, earthquakes? Well, sadly, we cannot predict earthquakes. Yeah. Um, okay. No, we, what we do is forecast very similar to weather patterns. It's the earth is a really complex system and there's a lot that we don't know about earthquakes, partially because we can't see what's happening down deep inside the earth. We do experiments in the laboratory to try and understand the properties of the rocks. We try and look and see if there's any precursors to earthquakes, which we haven't found yet. We know where the stress is building up. We know about how much stress has built up in a lot of cases uh, between earthquakes, but we don't know exactly what's gonna set the fault off on a human timescale. So instead of saying, there's gonna be a magnitude 6.2 on Tuesday, what we can say is there's likely to be a magnitude greater than a 6.5, uh, and I'm making this up off the top of my head right now. I don't actually know this number off the top of my head. Magnitude 6.5 in San Francisco in the next 30 years. And you know, earthquake prediction would be great. It would be awesome to be able to do that. And the reality still is that people live in earthquake prone regions their houses are there, their schools are there, their businesses are there, their lives are there. So we have to make sure that even though it would be great to give people warning, what we wanna do is make sure that we can build structures and build places that are gonna withstand the shaking so that people can live there after the earthquake happens too. Um, we do have a system called earthquake early warning. So if you go to uh, the USGS, you can find something called shake alert. And this is happening uh, in California and on the West Coast more broadly. And the way it works is really clever, right? So an earthquake, and you don't wanna know about every earthquake. There's like 14 earthquakes a day that happen in California, but most of them are too small. Trust me, you don't wanna know about every earthquake. It's <laughs> all you do all day. It's all I do all day. There's millions of them. So you wanna know about the big ones. You wanna know about the big ones that are gonna happen where you are or where people are. And that's a different kind of question. So when an earthquake happens uh, that's big enough it sends these waves out, right? And these seismometers start to pick it up. And if four seismometers pick up ground shaking above a certain level, they send out an alert or to, to systems, right? To like um, the USGS or to their partner organizations. And then they send out an alert to people's cell phones or to TV stations and radio stations that say earthquake shaking is imminent. It's coming, drop cover and hold on. And it can, in some cases, even give you an amount of time. So maybe that time is, if you're far, if you're too close, you're too close. But if you're far enough away, maybe you get 10 or even 20 or 30 seconds. People are like, why do I need 20, 30 seconds? Imagine you're um, getting a cavity filled. You would want that 10 seconds, right? For the dentist to be like, Whoop, let's not do that right now. <laughs> or you're getting LASIK eye surgery, right? Like there are some situations where that amount of time matters. It also can slow down trains to prevent derailments. It can open the bay doors in um, fire stations to prevent them from jamming shut. And it can do things like shut down automatic systems like gas lines or water systems to prevent additional cascading hazards as a result of the earthquake. So that kind of system can 
uh, do a lot in terms of helping to prevent loss of lives and, and property. Yeah, so it sounds like a lot of the focus is on mitigation and not so much prediction. Um, is there is kind of a prediction a, a area of your seismology research? Is oh, there yeah. you know a whole area? I'm very questions? interested in knowing um, when exactly earthquakes are going to happen, how big they're going to be. Right now, we're not real sure why they start. Like, what's the straw that breaks the camel's back that causes that to happen? Mm -hmm. And we're also not super sure why they stop because not every earthquake ruptures its full length every time. So, you know, we have good ideas that it could be a place in the fault where there's a kink or where there's something called an asperity where it's hard to go past there and there's not enough energy to kind of break through that. But sometimes they do and other times they don't. We don't know why that affects the magnitude of the earthquake. So there's a lot of really fundamental questions that people are still working on. And there's really new exciting advances that are coming out more and more, you know, as we have uh, better technology, as we have better resolution, um, as we have more folks with diverse perspectives and ideas coming into science, we're starting to solve some of these problems, but there's a lot out there that still remains to be, to be explored. And are there um, ways to track, I'm sure there probably is, to, you were mentioning that you can do the carbon isotopes um, kind of tracking to see when past earthquakes happen. Um, is there kind of like a trend that any scientists have noted um, based on when, you know, earthquakes happening thousands and thousands, millions of years ago to now? So uh, every fault is different. And the amount of stress and strain that's building up on faults is different. And every earthquake that happens changes the stresses on the fault around it, right? And so there's a big debate in seismology and geology in general about whether or not there's something called a characteristic earthquake, whether or not earthquakes on the same fault always behave in the same way. Are they uh, of the same magnitude every time? Do they happen about the same? So it's a, called a recurrence interval. Do they happen the same amount of time apart? You know, like we hear about 100 year floods, but you can have 200 year floods one year after the next, right? It's a statistical idea of the, the, the amount of time. So we can say, this drives me crazy. Please don't say this, y'all. You know, the San Andreas fault is overdue, right? Like it's not pregnant. <laughs> there's, a, there's a large basis of possible times when it could happen. We can look back and say over the past, again, making this up, over the past 10,000 years, there's been an earthquake on average every 300 years, and it's been 350 years. But an average is an average. You know, if you're saying the average car costs $10,000, well, some people have $100,000 cars and some people have $2,000 cars, but it's the average. So you know, it can go one way or another. So it's trying to give the best possible possible estimate and then knowing how much strain is building up along there. So it really is a game of probability. And there's a lot of information on the USGS website. If you type in, you know, USGS probability and there's this amazing working group uh, called uh, NEHERP and they, they just, they're doing all sorts of things, looking at all these different factors and trying to figure out what, the risk and the hazard are in different places based on all the evidence that we have about um, kind of past earthquakes and current knowledge and technology. Cool. And then uh, this is a pretty cool question that I've never thought about coming in. We have, do you know anything about earthquakes on other planets? Yes. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. I'm so glad you asked that. Oh, I even have stickers about it. Look. Ooh. So y'all, this is amazing. There is a seismometer right now on Mars and it's not detecting earthquakes because it's not earth. They're Mars quakes because it's Mars, <laughs> but it's, it's so cool. And you can go to our website and you can actually look at the seismic data from Mars. Do, you, do we see similarities between quakes on earth and quakes on Mars? Mars quakes actually look a lot more like moon quakes than they do like earthquakes, but we still, I mean, this data is like all brand new. It launched gosh, I don't even remember. It landed in November, I think a year and a half ago. And so the data is just now coming in. Like it's, it's brand new and it doesn't look like what people were expecting. And there's all this cool stuff. So look up Mars Insight and the Insight lander is um, trying to study the geophysical properties of Mars. So it wants to know about the heat flow, wants to know about how it's wobbling, wants to know about the seismology because the seismology is gonna tell us about what's inside of Mars. Like that's the tricky thing about earthquakes, right? They produce waves that travel across the surface of the planet, but they also go through the, the planet's interior. 
And the way that they change as they move through the planet's interior can tell you what's inside that planet. So we'll be able to figure out what's inside of Mars, how much heat it's giving off. And these are all gonna give us clues um, explaining kind of the overall formation of the rocky planets in our solar system, which is awesome. So yes, there's like, there are quakes on other planets, but they may not have the same um, uh, cause. So like most of our earthquakes are caused by plate tectonics. And it may be that most of the quakes on Mars are caused by cooling, contracting and expanding because there's such a big temperature difference between night and day. But yeah, who knows? Do we see those types of like heat cooling patterns in like desert areas on earth? Not really. It's no, not, they're know. not extreme enough. Right. Okay. And would any of the data that they're collecting from Mars or anything be able to tell us about if there's any water on, on Mars? Like does water have any huge effect on earthquakes that we can tell based on our data from land? Sometimes on earth water can like, like in, um, uh, wastewater injection, it can change things in that kind of way. There's not enough, if there is water on Mars, which I think there is, um, there's not enough of it to make a difference. Mm -hmm. So it's not like flowing and affecting, you know, right. right. Yeah. All right. And so those were our last questions from viewers, but I would be interested to hear a little bit about uh, personal research that you've been involved with, um, with earthquakes or hearing about like your favorite part of studying all this, how you kind of, you know, how it start all started. Right, so I have a, yeah, not the most normal story about how I got interested in earthquakes. So I, um, I was a theater major, like I, that was my jam. Shakespearean stage acting like is my jam. And that's what I was doing at school. And I took, um, you know, you have to take like education classes, general ed classes. I took uh, a geology class and I realized I was like the only person awake in that 250 person lecture hall. And I'm like, oh, tell me about soil horizons. This is so interesting. And so I started taking more geology classes and I ended up getting a geology major along with my theater major. But then I went to LA and I was a professional actor for a long time, like four years. I mean, I worked in a lot of restaurants. Let's not get crazy, like <laughs> doing it. And then this earthquake called the Hector Mine earthquake happened. It was a ma magnitude seven plus out in the desert, but it was widely felt across LA. And it was like amazing. It was crazy. The, the idea that the ground underneath of you is not solid was like, and you can know it, but when you feel it, like you know it a different way. So I went to the USGS to volunteer and they were like, yeah, no, don't go to the USGS the day after a major urban earthquake. They're busy. <laughs> well, I persisted. I went back and eventually this woman named Lisa Wald let me um, help her out on a project. And it turned out I was really good at it. And so they hired me. And a few years later, I was the outreach and education specialist for the USGS Earthquake Hazards Program in Southern California, which is like a big thing because there's a lot of people there. There's a lot of seismic risk. And I really loved it. I loved the idea that the knowledge about earthquakes could help people keep them safer, make them less anxious, make them you know, have some control over a, a scary and uncontrollable situation. And the science of it was really cool. So I went back and I got a master's degree and a PhD studying earthquake geology, but I always was really interested in um, kind of the, as Lucy Jones would say, the science activation, how you can take the science that you know and activate it for society. You know, make sure that we're creating policies and uh, creating building codes that are actually going to keep people safe and keep buildings from collapsing, making sure that we're talking to populations in the right way, which means talking to psychologists and sociologists and making sure that we have interdisciplinary connections with engineers and lawmakers so that we can all come together using the best data we have to make sure that our communities are safe. So that's kind of how I got into the science communication thing which now that I have a bunch of kids, I can't run off to the Himalayas for six months every year and do research, which was awesome. And I would love to do again one day, but you know, you have to have a lot of different tools in your tool belt and then you can just pull them out at different times. So I love the field work. I love, you know, I got to travel the world. I've worked in, you know, Bolivia and Argentina and China and Pakistan, all these places. Um, technically we weren't supposed to be in Pakistan, but the border is a little, wishy-washy in some areas. So yeah, I miss field work, but I also think that um, communicating science is really critical. Yeah, and I, I love that story. It sounds like the fusion of the theater and the 
um, sciences kind of came together to offer the perfect the perfect job for you, which is yeah. communicating these things. So that's awesome. Well, like anybody that's out there in high school or college that's thinking about what you want to do with your life, number one, it's okay not to know. Number two, you don't have to follow the traditional route, right? Like you don't have to decide to just do one thing. You can bring together the things that you're good at and the things that you're passionate about and make your own path. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's that's the perfect part to leave off at. Um, I don't. We don't have any other additional questions, but if they do come in um, after the presentation is posted, I will hunt you down in your emails and get the answers for everyone. Um, I'll let you get back to homeschooling your three kiddos now. I'm sure that that's a huge handful. So thank you so much for spending your morning with us. This was a really awesome presentation. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate uh, being given the opportunity to talk to everybody today. And it was great to get to know you, Abby. Thanks. All right. Take care. Bye.